we also have ESO-137001. This is a spiral galaxy in the cluster Abel-3627. And this one is notable mostly because it's trailing gas and young stars behind it as it plows through the intergalactic medium. Uh, as we saw before in, in Abel-400, most galaxy clusters are filled with this diffuse, hot intergalactic gas. And this is what this galaxy is currently speeding through. And this is causing something called ram pressure stripping, where the, where the gas from the galaxy itself is just being sheared off it as it goes. And so what's interesting about this is that it has ramifications for the future evolution of this galaxy, because all its gas is being taken away right now as, as it's moving, and there might be no gas left for future star formation for this galaxy. Um, next we have, as the first of our uh, regular star birth galaxies, uh, IC10, which is an irregular dwarf galaxy in the local group. So this is fairly close by. It's also the only star burst galaxy in the local group. And it's notable for how many X-ray binaries it has. Um, the fact that it's going through star burst means that there's a lot of young massive stars. And these are generally what form X-ray binaries, since an X-ray binary has to have at least one component that is a neutron star or a black hole, and those only come from massive stars. So we've caught this galaxy at a fortuitous time where a lot of its, um, a lot of its most massive stars have already got supernova and formed these compact objects, but the stars that they are in binaries with are still around and therefore producing X-ray binaries. Next we have M100, a Messier 100. This is also a grand design spiral. You can see the spiral arms pretty clearly there, especially in the infrared. Um, it also has two small companion galaxies with it. And this is a starburst galaxy where the starburst is much stronger towards the core. And the reason for this is that the disk is deficient in hydrogen because it's been stripped away. And this might be something similar to what happens to this might be the future of ESO-137, where it has little gas left to form stars. Um, so this is also a notable galaxy because it's fairly close, so we've been able to determine its distance both by Cepheids and also by the type 1a supernova, as we've seen. Sen A, also known as Centaurus A, is a starburst elliptical galaxy, which is very unusual because ellipticals shouldn't be forming many stars at all. They're what's they're often referred to as red and dead, in that the only stars left in them are old red stars. There are no young blue stars left. Uh, so the fact that this is a starburst galaxy is highly, highly unusual. And it's thought that the reason for the starburst that's currently going on is that it actually just ate a small spiral galaxy. Um, another very prominent thing about this galaxy, as you can see in the purple, uh, I believe that's X-ray, and also radio, is the radio jets from the AGN. Uh, AGN is an active galactic nucleus. It basically means that the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy is spewing out a lot of energy for whatever reason. Um, generally, it's that it's consuming some matter and it's expelling energy, but AGNs are mysterious things. Um, so, it's thought that there might be a link between the starburst that's currently going on in this galaxy and also the AGN activity. The Phoenix Cluster, this is a massive galaxy cluster that has lots of X-ray emission. Um, it glows very brightly in the X-ray uh, from Chandra up there and also a further zoomed in image on the bottom there. So the central galaxy in this cluster is a very massive galaxy that has extremely high star formation rates as well as a growing supermassive black hole. And the reason for this being unusual is that the AGN jets generally, once it gets to a certain point, they'll start preventing star formation because the gas that's required for star formation is generally cold gas, but there's so much energy from the AGN jet that the gas can't cool and therefore it can't form stars. But what we've observed in this galaxy is in fact, both, and it's thought that the gas is actually condensing at the very edge of these giant X-ray cavities that have been carved out by the AGN jets. 
Finally, our last DSO is SPT-034652. Uh, this was discovered by the South Pole Telescope, hence the acronym. Uh, this is what's called a hyperstarburst galaxy. This is 12.7 billion light years away. So we're looking back to one or two billion years after the Big Bang. So this is also a great look back into the early, the early universe and the early, um, the era of early galaxy growth. And so this galaxy is noted to be uh, very, very bright in infrared. But since there's no evidence of a growing supermassive black hole, which is something else that could cause an infrared excess, it's thought that this galaxy is going extreme star formation. Um, it's about 4,500 solar masses per year. In comparison, our Milky Way forms about one solar mass per year of stars. So this is a lot, lot more than that. And it's thought that this might be due to a merger. Uh, simulations have been done of this galaxy. As you can see in the bottom right, that's one of the potential simulation um, images. And they found that if there has been a merger of galaxies uh, this early in the universe, that could cause this extreme star formation rate. Um, as always, multi-wavelength observations are very, very important to this. This uh, is the whirlpool in pretty much every available wavelength range, um, everything from x-rays through radio, and you can see how different it looks in all of these bands, and uh, the x-ray shows the supermassive black holes at the center, uh, optical, what we see of course, and there's also the infrared, which traces a lot of the dust for star formation, as well as H1 neutral hydrogen. And so multi-wavelength observations, of course, are very important for letting us see all these different things just by looking at different wavelengths of light. <clears throat> um, also, as always, the distance ladder measuring distances to things, everything from parallax up through Cepheids, and also this year, um, expanding into galaxies. Uh, the tully fisher relationship is very important for that, as well as type 1a supernovae, and also Hubble's law for the furthest. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about Cepheids and our Lyrae, which are new this year. Uh, Cepheids, uh, they are pulsating variable stars that follow the Levitt law, the period luminosity relationship. So between the period of the variable star itself, how fast it pulsates, and how bright it is, there's a fairly linear correlation between these two. And so once we know the period, we know how bright it is, and we can compare that to how bright it appears to be, and from that find its distance. Uh, our Lyrae, they're similar, they're also pulsating variable stars uh, with much shorter periods uh, on the order of a day or so. And these are also standard candles that can be used in much the same way. Our Lyrae, they're also known as globular cluster variables because they are often found in globular clusters. And so that's a large part of how we figure the distance to globular clusters is by our Lyrae's. Um, also, just to go over quickly, the Tully-Fisher relationship and Hubble's law. The Tully-Fisher relationship, it's a relationship between the luminosity of a galaxy and also its rotational velocity. Obviously, this only works for spiral galaxies where we can actually see the rotation. Ellipticals, eh, it's much harder. Um, and it's basically just a scaling relation between the two that lets us figure out distances. And Hubble's law as well, the recessional velocity of a galaxy, how fast it's moving away from us is related to its distance because it's intrinsically related also to the expansion of the universe. Another big topic as always is spectrum, everything from the stellar spectra that you see on the left there, um, O class through M class, um, and as well as the very pretty solar spectra that you see on the top right. Um, but as well, since this year includes stellar evolution in galaxies, uh, there's also galactic spectrum. And these are basically just a combination of millions of stellar spectra that are, have been stacked together, and they kind of average out. So it's harder to see some of the uh, more detailed spectral features, but large features like, um, like H alpha are still visible. And you could also, in general, tell whether a galaxy is bluer or redder based on its galactic spectra. Um, the bottom there is basically just an example of H alpha shift. 
uh, the further the galaxy is from us, um, the larger its re recessional velocity is, according to Hubble's law, and this will cause the wavelength of all the spectral lines, including H alpha, to be shifted. And this is generally how we determine the velocity of a galaxy. Radiation law, same as always. Wien's law, uh, the Stefan Boltzmann law as well, and how block bodies work. Um, and they're described, by, of course, by Planck's law. Planck's law itself is quite complex, but the important part to know about it is the shape of the spectra produces and what that means. Um, some basic equations and relationships, as always, things like the distance modulus, Kepler's third law, laws of circular motion, as well as the small angle formula, inverse square law, and some basic astronomical units. Uh, this year, we'll be using JS9, which is a in-browser version of DS9, and there will hopefully be more information forthcoming on this in the future, but if you want to check it out for yourself, it's a way to manipulate astronomical images, and um, it's available at that website in the link there. For resources, of course, there's the National Science Olympiad, where this webinar will be linked, as well as posted on the Chandra website, and as well as many of the NASA missions, Chandra, Hubble, Spitzer, uh, NRAO, which is the National Radio Observatory. All these have good information that you might want to check out as well as APOD, Astronomy Picture of the Day. They pull from a wide variety of different images and they often have very good descriptions there as well. Uh, so the event information, uh, National Event Supervisors, Donna Young and Tad Kobachek. Uh, rules clarifications, as always, are available on soinc.org under event information. Um, and just a general way to prepare for this event Read the event description, know what the rules are, that's important. <laughs> and then this webinar, as well as the PowerPoint associated with it, will be posted. Um, and they're good for a, a quick overview of the content topics and also the DSOs. Uh, the Astronomy Coaches Manual on NSO, that's also good for background information. And uh, the resources that I've listed, as well as the resources in the event description, are good for content and also for the images. Past that, YouTube. There's many astronomy videos on YouTube that can be helpful with this. Uh, Chandra in particular has some that are related to the DSOs for this year. Uh, invitationals, very useful just for knowing what the tests will be like and getting an idea of what might be on the tests. Um, in fact, there will be some tests from invitationals as well as sample state tests that will be posted on the NSO website. Uh, for you to access and for you to use for practice. And finally, the Sioli.org test exchange, a link there. Uh, very useful for past year's tests. Unfortunately, stellar evolution galaxies hasn't been a topic for quite some years, but you might still find relevant information there that you can use. And so that about closes out this webinar. Um, so thank you very much and good luck.